Welcome everybody to one more uh, Authors at Google talk. Uh, today with us is Hampton Sides uh, with this new book in the Kingdom of Ice. In the late 19th century, people were obsessed by one of the last uh, unmapped areas uh, of the globe, the North Pole. No one knew what existed beyond the fortress of ice rimming the Northern Oceans. All the theories about the foremost cartographer of the world, a German named August Petermann, believed that warm currents sustained a green island at the top of the world. National glory would fall to whoever could plant his flag upon its shores. James Gordon Burnett, the eccentric and stupendously wealthy owner of the New York Herald, had recently captured the world's attention by dispatching Stanley to Africa to find Dr. Livingston. Now he was keen to recreate that sensation on an even more epic scale. So he founded uh, an official US naval expedition to reach the pole, choosing as its captain a young officer named George Washington the Long. On July 8, 1879, the USS Jeanette set sail from San Francisco. They faced everything from snow blindness, polar bears, ferocious storms, frosty labyrinths, madness, and starvation. This is a tale of heroism and determination in the most unforgiving territory on Earth. Hampton Sides is an award-winning editor of Outside, a frequent contributor to National Geographic, and the author of best-selling histories, Hellbound on His Trail, Blood and Thunder, and Ghost Soldiers. Please uh, join me in welcoming Hampton to Google. All right. Um, it's good to be here. I had a bit of an adventure just getting here. I, they dropped me off at a building about 12 or 13 buildings over, and uh, it was sort of like uh, wandering around in the Arctic. Um, but uh, I got here, what an extraordinary, extraordinary place uh, to, to work. Um, the paperback version of In the Kingdom of Ice just came out two days ago, so I'm now on a book tour. Uh, I was in Seattle yesterday, but uh, uh, moving about the country. And uh, I always ask people when I first begin to talk about the voyage of the Jeanette, uh, barring those of you who uh, maybe already read the book, uh, how many of you had heard of the voyage of the Jeanette uh, prior to this? Big goose egg, yep. Uh, and that's exactly, that's what I encounter everywhere I go, and that's exactly the reason why I wrote this book. When I first heard about this, uh, while I was on an assignment with National Geographic to write about another Arctic explorer in, in uh, Oslo, uh, the great um, scientist and explorer Fridtjof Nansen. Um, I saw in the museum there in Oslo all these references, continuing references to the Jeanette expedition, the American, the famous American uh, voyage um, from the Gilded Age. And I was, uh, I'm an American, I said, well, why haven't I heard of this? W what, what, is, what is the Jeanette? And uh, sometimes it sort of takes asking just an obvious question like that to, to begin to bore into a story. And so I, I came home, I began to read the primary documents and got really, really interested in, in this story. It took me three years to do it. I traveled all over um, Siberia and, and uh, the high Arctic and the Bering Strait and uh, all over America in pursuit of it. it. I had a ball doing this story and I'm gonna today talk with you a little bit about some of my travels in pursuit of, of the Jeanette story and um, give you some of the background um, about what the expedition was, was about. Um, the men of the Jeanette, those that survived, uh, were, they returned home as, as, as great heroes. They were household names. They were uh, um, lauded and, and celebrated. Uh, there were blockbuster newspaper stories and magazine stories. Um, there were uh, parades in Manhattan. Um, there were, there were uh, monuments erected to them all, all over the country. Um, they, the survivors were um, entertained by the Tsar of Russia, um, Alexander III. Uh, the story was the subject of best-selling uh, books. The journals and the uh, uh, diaries of the commander became a best-selling book. Um, but it's completely 
obscure today, um, as, as the numbers here bear, bear out. It's a very, very, uh, uh, it's a story that slipped through the cracks of history. One place, though, where it is quite well known is this place. Um, this is the Jeanette Monument at uh, the Naval Academy in uh, Annapolis, uh, where um, George DeLong and his men are celebrated as, as, as part of the pantheon of great Navy uh, explorer heroes. And uh, when I was on the book tour, a former midshipman came up to me at some point and said, yeah, the Jeanette Memorial, that's something that they used to always require us uh, almost like a hazing ritual at midnight to go and uh, count the number of icicles on the, uh, on the monument and report back to, uh, to uh, the authorities or whatever. Uh, I, I guess it's your tax dollars at work. Okay, so the voyage of the Jeanette was really uh, based on the, uh, trying to prove or disprove an old, old idea, an old theory that goes back as far as the Greeks and the Vikings, um, but really came to be crystallized in this map uh, a 1592 Mercator map, which showed very clearly an open polar sea uh, through the ice uh, in the symmetrical way. They believed there were portals that led through the ice and that it was warm up there and that uh, there was an iron mountain in the center of it, which of course explains why compasses work. Uh, obviously a flawed idea, but once you get an idea like that enshrined in a map, especially a, a beautiful map, and a, a widely circulated and important map, it uh, becomes increasingly difficult to dislodge that idea from the public uh, imagination. So what you really had was several centuries of, of scientists and pseudoscientists and sometimes cranks uh, and various authors and explorers who tried to prove or disprove the existence of this fan fantastical body of water. Open polar sea. Of course, the, uh, the uh, Vikings had an idea, it was called Ultima Thule, some place beyond the ice where it was warm year round. Um, and there were various tropical and exotic animals uh, believed to be there. The, the Greeks had Hyperborea, which they talked about and believed that there was uh, beyond the ice, again, uh, a mountain range where the, griffin, where the griffins lived, uh, half lion, half eagle. Um, in the 1800s, though, you begin to get uh, a, a bunch of really bizarre ideas coming out of uh, particularly the United, the United States. John Cleve Sims was one of uh, these um, kind of cranks who believed that uh, at the top of the world there were these big holes that led down into the earth and that there were people who lived down there and they were just dying for us to, to go find them. Um, and he was very influential. He sold out lecture halls everywhere he went. Uh, members of Congress were taken with his idea. Um, this is what it's supposed to look like from the pages of Harper's Magazine. Uh, Sims as whole as it would appear to a lunarian with a telescope. <laughs> the hollow earth theory, holes at the poles. This is, the, this, is the, this idea, I thought, a very antique, antiquarian, uh, quixotic, uh, Idea, but then I googled, uh, I googled uh, uh, holes at the poles, and lo and behold, there is this large um, subculture. I mean, not large, but a fairly intense subculture of people who still believe that there are, are holes at the poles. And this is supposedly a confiscated, uh, a censored NASA photograph. Um, <laughs> There are people down there, they want us to find them, but uh, the particularly the Obama administration, has, has, has done everything it can to prevent us from knowing about its existence. So the idea has been very slow to die. and seems to be fairly deeply embedded in our, in our psyche. Um, Jules Verne um, had, had popularized the notion of, uh, of an open polar sea further with the publication of his book, uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth. Although he brought it underground, there were sort of subterranean lakes uh, that, um, that uh, in, in his novel, um, figure into the story. Uh, Mary Shelley, uh, of course, was fascinated with the North Pole. Uh, the, uh, Dr. Frankenstein f pursues his monster all the way to the North Pole in, uh, in the novel. Now, moving beyond... Uh, scientific theory to just fact. Uh, we know who lives at the North Pole. 
Uh, we know what's there. Uh, Santa Claus is there, and I, I, you know, I thought this must be a pretty old idea, but um, when, I do, when I was doing the research for the book, I found out that uh, really the idea of Santa being at the North Pole uh, came from this um, cartoon from Harper's from the 1860s, which shows him with his helpers and uh, his uh, workshop up there. So um, during the 1860s particularly, you begin to get uh, in, in 1870s and into the 1880s, you get this intense polar fever that begins to build, uh, particularly in the United States. This, this nagging, gnawing need to know what was at the top of the world, one of the last unmapped areas. It drove people crazy. And uh, it, it also had an element of, of nationalism for the United States. Uh, after the Civil War, emerging from the devastation of the Civil War, uh, we began to kind of flex our muscles uh, on the world stage, wanting to compete with the Brits, who had done most of the exploring, some of the, of course, the Russians and some of the Scandinavian countries. But we wanted to, um, we wanted to stake our claim in the Arctic and had uh, recently purchased from the Russians Alaska. And there was a, it was a real curiosity about what was north of our new territory. No one had ever been there. Some Arctic whalers had had sort of gone, been along the edges of the ice, but no one had ever really seen uh, what was north of Alaska. Now, there were a number of scientists who uh, uh, were interested in, the, in, in this question, but also very much interested in the open polar sea theory. One of them was this guy, Dr. August Peterman, who you alluded to in the introduction. Uh, Peterman uh, was the foremost map maker in the world at that time. Uh, Google, Google Maps uh, had nothing on this guy. Uh, he, he produced these absolutely beautiful, uh, hand-colored, uh, but mass-produced maps that brought in the, the latest findings from explorers. When they came back from Africa, or they came back from the interior of Australia, uh, he would pencil in the new, the new information. And so these were up-to-date. Uh, and highly sought after maps. And, and from this platform, and, and he published all these maps in Germany, in a place called Gotha, and uh, he was widely um, sought after. He was uh, popular on the lecture circuit. And on this platform, uh, he, uh, which he, you know, through the, by virtue of his maps, he was um, able to kind of promulgate his various theories, uh, almost all of which were wrong about what was at the top of the world. Uh, but people believed him because he was uh, erudite, he was a German scholar, and he also had excellent uh, facial hair, like a lot of the characters in this book. Uh, this is one of his masterworks, The Atlas of Physical Geography, um, his birthplace. I went to Germany and tried to kind of begin to understand his world and the power of maps, the power uh, especially in that age when there were just a few areas left in the world that had never been touched by man. Um, a monument to, to, to Peterman and Gotha. Um, but this begins to show a little of the theories uh, on, uh, on which the Jeanette expedition was based and, and Peterman's idea. We were beginning to learn that the, the Gulf Stream um, was uh, a, a powerful current that brought a lot of heat from the tropics north through the Atlantic Ocean and um, past England, past Norway. No one knew precisely where it went. And Peterman's theory was that it met the ice, tunneled under the ice, softened the ice as it went, and eventually went to the North Pole. There's another current that they were also beginning to learn about uh, on the Pacific side, I don't know if you can see that, uh, called the Kuro Siwo, which is indeed a powerful current in the Pacific that goes north towards the Bering Strait. So his theory was, beautiful in its symmetry, somewhat grandiose, but uh, uh, was that these two great currents met at the North Pole. It was part of a massive thermoregulation system of the planet. And uh, the key word here being supposed, uh, open sea. But you know, again, you, you begin to see oh, the, these ideas on maps, and it's just, it just uh, becomes impossible to, uh, to get rid of the idea until explorers, unfortunately, have to go and live or die, uh, suffer at any rate, uh, to prove the theory. Somebody who was captivated by Peterman's ideas was, was this guy, um, the third richest man in New York at the time, the publisher and editor of the, of the largest newspaper in the world, the New York Herald. Uh, this is James Gordon Bennett, Jr., who was this 
Gilded Age character, a spoiled brat, a guy who got pretty much everything he wanted, a, a reckless adventurer himself, um, a lover of spectacle. He was the uh, youngest um, commodore of the New York Yacht Club. He was, uh, he won the first trans transatlantic yacht race. He was famous for uh, driving coaches around Ma uh, Manhattan nude at midnight. Uh, he publicly urinated into a grand piano uh, in a, at a party, uh, a, a salon in New York, which got him ostracized from New York society. And so he said, uh, plague on all your houses, I'm moving to France. So he ran his newspaper by a transatlantic cable from Paris. Then he created the, the Paris Herald, which became the International Herald Tribune, which still exists, and uh, it's the, sort of the last remnant of his empire. Anyway, you can't invent a character as outsized or, or, or as grand as uh, Gordon, Gordon Bennett Jr. This was his newspaper, very influential paper, important paper also because he believed not only in reporting the news, but sort of creating spectacles that would generate more and more news and big blockbuster stories. Um, he had all these fetishes and things like, um, for example, he was really into Pomeranians. He had hundreds of them. I've seen a lot of dogs here on the Google campus, but uh, he, was, he had a particular thing about Pomeranians and uh, consulted them for you know, various ad pieces of advice. Um, he was also interested um, in owls. He had stuffed owls, living owls. Owls was, was the, sort of the symbol of, uh, his personal symbol and the symbol of the paper. This is the headquarters which shows owls on the eaves there. Uh, and this was interesting, they, uh, the, lie, the eyes of the owls lit up in red, um, with red lights and then they would wink at you at night. <laughs> One of his many yachts, this is the Lysistrata, which uh, had a uh, 200 seat theater, uh, it had um, uh, a Turkish bath, and it had padded stalls for his dairy cows so he could have fresh cream every morning for breakfast. <laughs> so, you know, this is the Gilded Age, just tremendous sums of money, uh, certain individuals who had and were able to wield a lot of power with this money, and he pretty much got what he wanted. Um, now, my wife and I, uh, of course, we, we felt we had to go to Paris um, to research. Um, <laughs> Uh, Gordon Bennett. This is one of his mansions in, in Paris, uh, a villa in the south of France near Monaco, where he kept, kept the, the Lysistrata. We barged our, our way into the house, and uh, still people there li living there, and uh, they knew all about Bennett. There were signs of Bennett everywhere, including owls <laughs> all over the all over the place. Um, Bennett's also famous for um, bringing uh, international um, ballooning um, to the forefront. He created this uh, balloon race, which still exists, the, the, the Bennett Cup. So that's one of his legacies. Uh, but he's most famous for, for sending this guy, this is Henry Morton Stanley, to Africa to find Livingston. Livingston, I presume. Uh, Livingston wasn't really lost, he didn't really need to be found, but uh, it made for a great spectacle and a great uh, series of dispatches in the uh, New York Herald. So really, Bennett was looking for an encore to Stanley Livingston when he kind of began to cultivate this idea of bankrolling uh, an expedition to the North Pole to test the theories of August Peterman. He hired this guy to uh, lead the expedition. This is George Washington DeLong, the commander of the Jeannette, uh, a graduate of the Naval Academy, uh, someone who had uh, been to Greenland, had de devoted the rest of his life to trying to figure out this planetary enigma. What's up at the, at the North Pole? He wanted to be the first to do it, and to do it for his country, and for his Navy, and, and for science. Um, Bennett purchased this vessel, renamed it the, the, the Jeanette after his sister, Jeanette Bennett. And uh, DeLong sailed it around the Horn from, from France to San Francisco in uh, 1878. And in San Francisco, it was massively reinforced for the ice, practically rebuilt. Uh, and then they began to stuff it with all the latest American inventions, including Edison's lights, which had just been designed. They were still being perfected. They weren't quite ready. <laughs> as it turned out. Um, 
telephone equipment from Alexander Graham Bell, uh, uh, telegraph equipment. They wanted to be able to communicate it over, over vast expanses of the ice. Um, many, many, many kegs of Budweiser beer. Uh, they had a state-of-the-art library. They had um, an organ. <laughs> uh, they knew they were going into the ice, and this was going to be a long, long voyage. They had enough food for three years. Um, and uh, they left San Francisco in the summer of 1879. Uh, 20,000 people were, were there to, uh, to celebrate and to uh, <laughs> send them off to, in, into the Arctic. Yeah, you had a question? Yeah, just wondering how many people were on the ship. Uh, 32, uh, 33 men, uh, Captain DeLong and 32 men. Uh, they headed north um, past Alaska. That last stop was Alaska, where they picked up uh, 40 dogs and two Inuit uh, hunters. Uh, it was a very international cast of characters. Um, there were five or six na naval officers. There was a surgeon. There was a meteorologist. Uh, there was a naturalist. Uh, and there, there was uh, an ice pilot, someone who ha had a career really in the uh, Arctic as, as a, a whaler. And, uh, and there were two Chinese um, uh, cooks that were, had been hired in Chinatown in San Francisco. So it's, it's a motley crew of, of individuals heading north to, uh, to test Peterman's theories. Went through the Bering Strait, through the Chukchi Sea, past Wrangell Island. Um, they didn't find a warm water current. They did not find the open polar sea. Uh, what they found was, was uh, one minute. what they found was ice. <laughs> a lot of it. They got stuck in the ice in September of 79 and uh, began to drift in the ice in a northwesterly direction, uh, and they drifted for two years. Two years, um, about a mile a day, uh, every day is more or less like the next sort of Groundhog Day kind of thing and uh, presented an interesting dilemma for me as a writer because I, I didn't know exactly how to tackle the problem of those two years. So I did something I didn't think I would ever do, which is uh, kind of a cinematic thing. I had a little break at the end of one chapter, had a next section and I just said, one year later. <laughs> and uh, because every day was almost identical to the next. Um, So uh, during this two years, DeLong had his men out every day measuring uh, the ice, taking lots of um, uh, measurements of barometric pressure, temperature, um, specific gravity, all kinds of things that they were trying to, um, you know, it was like a floating or, or a, a drifting ice station, Arctic ice station, really, um, as they worked their way north. Um, during this two-year period, they, the men really get to know each other. <laughs> A lot of togetherness, and uh, some of the characters really emerge uh, as uh, as real um, real striking uh, characters in the book. And I, I grew to know to know these men, to love them, sometimes to hate them uh, while I was writing them. Some of the ones that really emerge: this is Melville, the engineer, a distant relative of Herman Melville, the writer, uh, an amazing man who could fix anything, and believe me, everything went wrong during this expedition, and he was called upon to, for example, the ship was constantly leaking as the ice was, was strangling the uh, hull of the vessel. And so he devised a series of windmills to bring up all the, all the excess water, kept the sh ship afloat for those two years. This is Melville as an old man when he, be when he became an uh, engineer of the entire U.S. Navy and uh, ultimately uh, Rear Admiral. Uh, there's Collins, uh, the Irishman, uh, who was the meteorologist and the, the scientist of, uh, on board. Interesting man, brilliant man, but unfortunately, he had a propensity for delivering puns, like really, really bad puns, and he couldn't help himself. Now, that's fine. Never, we've all been around people like that for two days or something. That, that might be fine. This was two years. Everyone wanted to kill Collins. Um, there was um, Ambler, the uh, surgeon, who saw every kind of malady you can imagine, uh, particularly vitamin deficiencies. There was lead poisoning. Uh, there was polar bear uh, liver ingestion problems. Uh, I guess that's vitamin A. Uh, he saw it all and had to be quite creative in, in treating these various ailments. What, uh, ailments. One of the ailments that he had to treat was 
was uh, Dannenhauer's case of syphilis. Turned out that the uh, Dannenhauer, who was the navigator, and a brilliant man, uh, uh, the, uh, also a graduate of the Naval Academy, turned out that he had syphilis. And it manifested itself in the form of a eye condition called syph syphilitic iritis, uh, which required uh, dozens and dozens of operations without anesthesia uh, down, in the, uh, down in the ship. Uh, and he, ha he could not tolerate any light whatsoever, so he had to wear these goggles uh, the entire voyage, somewhat symbolizing this voyage, this doomed voyage, that you have essentially uh, a blind navigator. <laughs> not a good thing. So they drifted, though. The first year was kind of like this, just uh, all over the place. They circled back on themselves many times, which was extremely frustrating. But finally, uh, the drift kind of smoothed out, and they worked their way to the Northwest. DeLong, by this point, had completely given up on the open polar sea theory. He was cursing Peterman's name, but he thought he might not sail to the North Pole, but he, but he might um, drift there in the ice. If the ship, which had been massively reinforced, if the ship could withstand the pressure, he thought they might drift to the North Pole because they were heading in the right direction. He had dogs. He thought maybe he'd get out on the ice and make a dash for it. Every day, as I mentioned earlier, the, the men were out on the ice taking measurements of everything. And uh, the log books, which ended up in the National Archives in Washington, uh, they're very heavy, folio-sized books. The, when I was reading them, uh, I was just thinking, gosh, you know, the journey that these books took to, to get into National Archives. They're heavy, they're cumbersome. Uh, DeLong had to make some strategic decisions about keeping them as things go from bad to worse during the expedition. Uh, but there they are. But then, you know, when I was reading them, I was thinking, you know, this is terrible. This is uh, what a waste of all this energy, uh, you know, all this data, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of data uh, about the condition of the Arctic. Uh, and I thought, what a waste. Um, but then I found out that um, NOAA, uh, in, in tandem with a group called Old Weather, has been taking the DeLong journals and digitizing all this data and using it uh, ultimately to study the condition of the Arctic. Because when you're talking about global warming, um, one of the problems they've always had is no one really knows what the condition of the ice was 150 years ago. Because to do that, you'd have to go in, in a, a time machine back to the 1800s. You'd have to ram yourself in the ice. You'd have to drift for two years in the ice and take daily measurements, even hourly measurements. No one would do that, right? Uh, well, someone did, and it's George DeLong and his men. And this is a stretch of the Arctic no one had ever been through before. Uh, and these books are proving, uh, and log books are proving extremely valuable um, now in these, uh, in these studies that are going on. When I do these uh, narratives, I like, whenever possible, to travel to the places I'm writing about. Um, and this story mostly takes place in Arctic, uh, in Arctic uh, sections of, of Russia. So I got myself a really bad haircut. And uh, I went to Moscow first to get a bunch of permits because, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't just go f uh, across from Alaska. There was, I was going to a lot of restricted areas. So a National Geographic fixer person uh, helped me get these permits. Uh, in Moscow, and then I flew, what is it, eight, nine time zones east, all the way to the east coast of Siberia, to Anadir, where I picked up this uh, Russian uh, icebreaker. It's, it's not quite fully an icebreaker, it's a reinforced vessel, and headed north. I thought it was pretty ridiculous that I had to travel 13,000 miles to look at my own country, Alaska, um, <laughs> heading north, waving at Sarah Palin as I went. Um, <laughs> along the uh, northeast coast of Siberia. Um, amazing place, mostly uninhabited. We did stop at this one village uh, where, uh, where they had just killed a whale and they were having a festival, summer festival, and invited us ashore and we stayed there for a few hours. I took this with an iPhone. But there were um, soldiers with Kalashnikovs that didn't really want us to be there. They ushered us back to the ship and we headed north uh, in the direction of Wrangell Island, which is where we were going. There was a crew of, um, there was a French documentary crew that was doing something about woolly mammoths. Uh, there were um, various atmospheric scientists, and then there was uh, just a whole bunch of intense birders, you know, like uh, really, really into bird, uh, birding, professional birders almost. Uh, as we headed north, uh, 
we encountered more and more ice until we got to this place where uh, I'm, this is looking straight down from the bow of the ship, and I just took this again with an iPhone, but it gives you some sense of, of um, how quickly the ice can, can build up. And this is in the month of August. So that brought us to a complete halt. We had to back up and refigure our course. Um, but we eventually reached our destination, which was Wrangell Island. Um, Wrangell Island is a very interesting place. It, it's been called the Galapagos of the High North. It's got a huge amount of wild, wildlife, uh, Pacific walrus and, and snowy uh, owls and snow geese and Arctic fox and, um, and polar bears, lots and lots of polar bear. Um, August Peterman thought that it was a continent uh, it had only been glimpsed by some Arctic whalers, and it looked pretty large. And he had this grand theory that it was it was actually Greenland. That Greenland came up over over the not quite the pole, but near the pole, and all the way um, to the other side. And that this was the the tip of Greenland. Another one of his obviously wrong ideas, um, but an interesting place nonetheless. It's uninhabited. Um, there are four Russian rangers who live there, um, are stationed there. And they were, when we came ashore in these uh, little zodiac rafts, um, th these Russian uh, rangers were so happy to see us. <laughs> so happy to see fresh human life. Um, and we were happy that uh, the, the two or three cabins that were there were all reinforced on the windows there with bear guards uh, because there are polar bears uh, everywhere. Um, they congregate in larger and larger numbers there because during the summer, the ice is increasingly unreliable. And uh, this is one of the only scraps of land uh, for thousands of miles in any direction. Um, so this is one of the places that, that they go. I was there with a photographer named Sergei Gorshkov who uh, has been going to Wrangell for, for over a decade, taking these amazing wildlife pictures for National Geographic magazine. And a story that I wrote uh, came out in March of 2013. Arctic fox puppy. Um, they're constantly battling over these uh, snow, snow geese eggs. Sometimes the geese win, sometimes the foxes win. Muskox. Also, um, excellent facial hair. Um, so that's Wrangell Island. It's, it's an extraordinary place. And uh, was one of the goals that, that DeLong was reaching for. When he realized that he was going to be stuck in the ice, he be then began to hope, well, at least I can land on Wrangell and explore Wrangell. But he wasn't able to get there. The ice took him up and over and around it too quickly. Um, so he never landed on it. Um, Another thing about Wrangell is it's believed to be the last place on Earth where woolly mammoths lived, uh, some 3,000 years after they became extinct on the mainland. Uh, so you see tus uh, tusks all over the island uh, in riverbeds like this. And uh, Sergei just took this shot of me. I tried to fit it into my overnight bag. It wouldn't fit. Um, it's, it's extraordinary, though. You see these just everywhere you go. Um, DeLong did not reach Wrangell, but uh, another American vessel did reach it um, that summer of 1881. Uh, they were looking for the Jeanette at that point. They wanted to get some tidings of what had happened to the Jeanette because it had been gone, been gone for two years. On board that vessel was the father of the American environmental movement, John Muir, who then was a, a young newspaper man, um, and he wrote beautifully about the search for the Jeanette uh, that summer of 1881. And he becomes a pretty important character in the, in the middle of the book. <clears throat> uh, after Wrangell Island, I went on to other parts of Russia, including the Lena Delta, which is, uh, the, by some counts, the largest delta in the world. Uh, the Lena River is a massive river that empties into the Arctic Ocean in central Siberia. Uh, and uh, I wanted to go to a place called America Mountain. 400 miles north of the Arctic Circle, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of this delta, is a place called America Mountain, known there still to this day as America Mountain. Uh, it's, it's a place, it's a monument that was built in the 1880s uh, to the Jeanette. And so it took me forever to get there. I did a story for Outside Magazine that got me up the river and after I, well, I had to get on a river boat and then a, a smaller boat and then finally a, a raft. And then finally, at the end, I just had to start wading across all this water, swatting mosquitoes constantly. It was the most 
mosquito-infested place I've ever been. Uh, we finally found America Mountain and got to the top of it and found the monument more or less as, as it had been left from the 1880s. Um, that's taken at about 2 or 3 in the morning, that photo, photograph. So it doesn't get dark in the middle of the summer. Um, anyway, back to the historical story. Um, so all through, the, all through 1880 and 1881, uh, the men of the Jeanette are drifting uh, in a northwesterly direction. But uh, finally in um, June of 1881, it becomes clear that the ship is not going to withstand the pressure. Uh, DeLong doesn't have much time. He can tell the ship is sinking. He gets all his stuff out on the ice. And um, you know, a lot of decisions had to be made about what to bring. Uh, because he, he could tell it was going fast. And, and finally it did sink to the bottom of the Arctic Ocean. This is a French painting that maybe makes it a little more heroic looking than it actually was, but um, it, uh, it sank to the, to the bottom and uh, DeLong and his 32 men and 40 dogs are out on the ice with their three open boats, small whale boats, uh, with no other choice but to drag their, these boats and their few belongings south to the nearest landmass, which was the central Arctic coast of Siberia. Um, now, we know exactly where the Jeanette sank. Um, he, the, DeLong took exact measurements um, when it sank, and uh, it's in Arctic waters, uh, not very far from the, the DeLong Islands, because uh, his, DeLong and his men discovered three islands. Uh, and um, there's a group of scientists, both in Russia and in the United States, uh, NOAA scientists, also the US Navy, uh, and uh, a Russian group of scientists, and, and as well as the G Russian Geographical Society, are all interested in finding the wreck and photographing it and maybe bringing up some relics, including those uh, lights of Edison's that didn't work. And also the photographs, all the photographs that were taken of this expedition on glass plates uh, went down with the ship. So there's a movement now, even though our relationship with Russia officially is not very good, um, there is a movement to try to, to, to build an expedition for next summer. Um, so we'll see how that goes. I, I'm, I'm very excited about it and want to go. Um, okay, so in the summer of 1881, back in America, what was happening? Well, first thing, Bennett had decided that summer it was time to bring this sport from England that was known as tennis uh, to the United States and introduce it to the country. Um, so he built this enormous palace. It's called the Newport Casino in Rhode Island. It's uh, now the International Hall of Fame for tennis. Uh, so while the men are out on the ice cap, uh, DeLong, uh, excuse me, Bennett is back in Rhode Island introducing tennis to the United States and uh, not suffering so much. He invites DeLong's wife, Emma DeLong, uh, up to Newport uh, for some tennis and yachting. Um, the Gilded Age, you know, it's a, it's a good time. And um, Emma DeLong becomes a pretty important, I'd say very important character in the middle and end of the book uh, for a variety of reasons. Mainly, uh, she wrote beautifully. She wrote these beautiful, beautiful letters. Uh, and uh, I had this rather amazing experience, um, which I think historians dream about, which is this notion, historians dream of this thing where you find a descendant of one of your main characters, and uh, the, that descendant tells you, hey, you know, I just happen to have this trunk full of letters in my attic. Um, would you please come and take it off my hands? And uh, that's exactly what happened. Um, I met, um, I heard about, actually cold called, this woman, Catherine DeLong, in Connecticut. She said she had this trunk full of letters, and it was the personal papers of Emma DeLong. Um, please take them. And, give them, donate them to a library somewhere eventually. But this is me and Catherine DeLong at the Explorers Club in New York City, which is an amazing place, the Explorers Club. Uh, lots of taxidermy. Um, but she, she uh, loaned me these papers. And in the papers were all kinds of things, love letters, uh, all from the courtship days of, of Emma and George. Um, but also these letters that she wrote in the summer of 1880 and 1881 and sent north by way of these Arctic whalers in the hope that somehow, some way, they would reach her husband. And they're beautiful, beautiful letters. And it really kind of becomes a love story in the, in the middle portion of the book. One of those letters 
uh, she sent by way of Greenland. And uh, it ended up in a hut in far, far northern Greenland. And um, Robert Peary, uh, on his way to the North Pole, uh, found it. And uh, um, put it, he knew immediately who it was from. And uh, it still had the red wax seal on it, which you can see there. And uh, he stuffed it in his furs and eventually he got it back to New York City and hand delivered it to Emma DeLong. So that letter is in, is in that trove. So <clears throat> during the summer of 1881, DeLong and his men struggle over the ice. They have just the summer to do this. They know that once winter comes, they're going to be, they're, they're not going to survive it. Um, they don't have enough food, so they have to constantly hunt for polar bear and walrus and seal, which they proved to be very successful at. You'll be glad to know that the, the dogs are not eaten. Um, uh, they have plenty of other things to eat. Um, my editor wants us to do a kind of companion book uh, that would be the Jeanette cookbook. Uh, you know, like uh, fermented uh, walrus fetus, uh, all kinds of good stuff. Um, but they survive, and in fact, they thrive. And in a weird way, this is maybe the happiest period of the expedition because they're struggling every day. They're getting uh, ex ex they're in excruciating pain, but they're getting tremendous exercise and they're working for this common goal. Uh, DeLong organizes the men extremely well into these three teams um, that kind of compete against each other uh, and they work their way south uh, over the ice and um, they are on the ice for 92 days uh, until they finally uh, come to open water. Most of these uh, Arctic stories have uh, the perfect trifecta of um, uh, scurvy, uh, mutiny, and of course cannibalism. Uh, and this has none of those. And I think it's a testament to the leadership uh, of DeLong and the camaraderie of this group that they held this thing together for those 92 days. And uh, um, it's an extraordinary survival story, really, at this, in, in this part of the story. So this kind of shows their general um, uh, path south. It starts out that they aren't going south. You see here, uh, they go kind of north. And that's not because they didn't have a compass. Uh, it's because they, um, they struggled south and had a really productive period of about two weeks where DeLong thought they were making great progress. But then he took a positional reading and they realized that, they were, that, that the ice was drifting faster north than they were moving south. Uh, the whole ice pack was moving. And so it was sort of a Sisyphean effort. They were moving backwards. Um, then it kind of evens out here, and then they work their way south. They discover this island right here, Bennett Island, uh, which they declared American soil, raised the American flag. And, and, uh, and uh, just as um, um, John Muir's group when they landed on Wrangell Island, they declared it American soil. Uh, but the United States didn't do much to press their claim on that land, and it's now Russian uh, territory. So they worked their way through these islands that are called the, the New Siberians, uh, working their way towards the Lena, the Lena Delta. Uh, when uh, they finally encounter open water, they, they want to put their whaleboats in the water, but uh, turns out they are not seaworthy. Uh, dragging them over the ice, banging them up the whole time uh, had created leaks. So Melville and his carpenters uh, rebuild these boats using uh, driftwood, uh, whalebone, uh, walrus tusks, whatever they can find. They somehow patch them together and they finally set sail in late August um, in, in open water uh, when they encounter a massive gale, uh, practically a hurricane. And the three boats are separated from each other. And really, that is where I end my talk. Because the last 150 pages, 200 pages of the book are about what happens to those three boats and the very different fates of the three boats as they work their way toward land and toward safety. Um, so that's the story of the Jeanette um, as they work their way, really, towards this delta, um, a place that is said to be about the size of three Flor uh, Florida Everglades. Uh, except a frozen Everglades, uh, a labyrinth. Um, so these men are trying to find safety and trying to find each other in this uh, in incredibly tangled maze, uh, in this incredible landscape. 
So um, that is the story of the Jeanette. Um, don't Google it. <laughs> this is Google, but don't Google it. Uh, you can find out what happens, but it's, I believe the story is much more powerful, much more haunting, and much more beautiful if you don't know the fate of these men and what happens to them. Um, uh, don't read the New York Times book review, uh, which uh, is a complete plot summary of my book. Um, uh, I think you'll, uh, you'll really find that the last 200 pages or so um, extremely gripping and, uh, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a great survival story. It's a, a great story about men who, who stick together through incredible uh, strife and, and, and striving uh, and um, are incredibly loyal to each other um, as they uh, try to make it to safety. So that's the story of the Jeanette. Uh, I'd love to um, hear from you. Any questions from, from the audience about uh, how I write these books, how I research these books, narrative history. Um, any questions at all? Um, why do you think this tale hasn't really gotten the same kind of publicity as like Franklin or Shackleton or right. any of these other disaster right. explorers? Uh, I, I, it's a good question and I've thought about it a lot. And, and you know, I think that I think there's a combination of reasons. I mean, one is that I think the British are much better than the Americans at sort of celebrating their uh, noble failures. Um, uh, in fact, they love, they love those stories. Uh, in America, we like to win. You know, we like, we like to achieve and succeed. And uh, I think uh, Perry, uh, Perry reached the North Pole, although that's contested um, in 1909 with, with Henson. And um, we love that story. You know, that's the story that's, that we focus on a little bit more. Um, Franklin, Franklin Expedition was a colossal failure. Uh, Shackleton wasn't exactly a failure uh, in the sense that no one died, but they didn't reach their destination. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons. Another thing is that uh, all the photographs went down with the ship. We're a very visual culture. Um, those Shackleton pictures are amazing. They're truly amazing. And I think one of the reasons why Shackleton is so well known is because of those extraordinary images. Um, I think it's also just the kind of a burnout thing. I mean, this was so big in its time. It produced so many different books. And, and uh, there was, you know, all the survivors um, had their own accounts. And uh, Emma DeLong had her account. Uh, DeLong's journals were published and became best-selling books. So it, it did have its day, uh, but it kind of, you know, it just sort of burned out and then fell, fell between the cracks. And then Peary came along and, and other explorers. Um, who um, took the story farther? So th those are some of the reasons. Maybe they just you know there weren't there wasn't a good writer who came along to you know to deal with it. And I you know I hope I've begun to make a dent in this because I do truly believe it is one of the great one of the great survival stories, one of the great adventure stories of all time. And uh, it is sort of the American Shackleton, if you will. Uh, so two very different questions actually. What you just said kind of thought made me think of another one. What else would you put in the pantheon of great adventures? And then the other unrelated question is, how does the process of writing this book compare to your other books? Pantheon of great adventure stories. Well, that's, that's tough. Um, there's, um, well, certainly a N Nansen, who I mentioned at the beginning. Um, Nansen's, uh, what's a story about Nansen is uh, he tried to duplicate the voyage of the Jeanette and, uh, in a differently designed vessel. The Fram, uh, this boat that he uh, that he ha had built, and what happened was with Nansen, uh, Fridtjof Nansen from 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 Norway, uh, he found out that some relics of the Jeanette had washed up on shore in Greenland about five years after the Jeanette voyage, and uh, one of them was a a pair of sealskin pants that had on the inseam a little tag that said George Washington DeLong, and he realized that meant that these pants had come up and over the pole and had, had popped out on the other side in Greenland. And so he surmised, correctly as it turned out, that that, that was the prevailing pattern of the wind and the drift of the ice, the currents. And um, so George Washington DeLong didn't make it to the North Pole, but his pants did. Uh, <laughs> and he got to thinking, well, why don't I just ram myself in the ice in exactly the same place uh, that uh, DeLong, DeLong's men did, and uh, drift in the ice. He wasn't looking for the open polar sea anymore. Just use the, the ice, work with it. And that's what he did. And, and uh, his, his adventure, um, Furthest North is the, the book that he wrote, um, is an extraordinary story. Um, they got very close to the North Pole, realized he wasn't going to reach it. 
and uh, got out on the ice with uh, his dogs and another guy, and uh, they made a dash for the pole. They didn't quite make it. They turned around, couldn't find the Fram. He's unofficially called the father of oceanography as well. Yeah. Answer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was, he was a brilliant scientist. He was a statesman, uh, and he ultimately won the Nobel uh, Peace Prize. Uh, extraordinary man. So I, I put Nansen's adventures at the very top of all the Arctic um, adventures that, that I've read about. Um, of course, there's Amundsen and um, the, the Scandinavians, the, the Norwegians are the best <laughs> at, this, at this kind of exploration, I think. Um, the other question is, how, how did this differ from my other books? Um, you know, I, the biggest difference is I had to go farther afield than any of my other books. I, you know, I like to travel to, where, to wherever the story takes place, but this one, it was really hard to get to Russia. I mean, it was, uh, luckily, it was just a little window where our relationship with Russia was pretty good. Uh, and I was able to get those permits and go to these restricted areas. Um, it was expensive, though, and complicated and logistically uh, involved. And, uh, but I love doing that. That's the fun part of doing these stories is, is to, and it, it pays off in so many ways in the way you write about ice or you write about the tundra or, or, or you know, any of these passages that I have. It gives you a confidence uh, about you know, describing landscape um, that you couldn't otherwise, um, you couldn't otherwise get. Um, and I also just wanted to understand the Gilded Age. It's just such a fascinating period. You know, as America is beginning to look familiar. It's not quite there yet. It's still, it's like a, a brawling teenager that's, you know, trying to figure out what it is, has a lot of ambition, has a lot of uh, technological prowess, but is still not quite a mature country. And uh, so you get people like Bennett, you get people, you know, like Edison and, and all these inventions that are, that are happening. And it's trying to flex its muscles on the world stage. It's, it's a really interesting time. All right, we're gonna sign some books if you like. Thank you very much, pleasure being here.